like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of his wind And mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware Of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory I realize just How beautiful you are And how great your affections are for me Oh, how he loves us all Oh, how he loves us How he loves us so Unforeseen kiss and my heart turns violently inside of my chest. I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way that he loves. Well, greetings, AFM. Another video sermon uh, as we're still on the social isolation. And uh, again, we want to be good citizens so that we are going to be doing this uh, until we get different word from uh, our na national, state, and local leaders as to when we can meet again. Uh, wouldn't it be awesome if we could meet by Resurrection Sunday if that was the Sunday we got back, let's start praying. God, that'd be so awesome if we could meet then. I do want to remind us right away that if uh, any of you have needs that uh, we don't know about, uh, please call me at 812-457-8088 or at, you can email me at jim dot or, or period wyrock, W-E-I-H-R-A-U-C-H at gmail.com. Uh, and we'll try to help you as best we can within our means. Speaking of which, I often say this to you, so this is for AFM people. If we've got guests listening right now, you know, just sort of pause yourself. AFM, uh, we did well with our giving last week. I'm glad that you were faithful. Listen, there are going to be opportunities and maybe necessities that require AFM to help some people 
And as I've often said to us, there's not any one of us that can do a lot, but if we all come together and pull the resources together, be faithful to giving to God out of a heart of gratitude and a heart of joy for what he has graciously given us, then we can help as the needs arise. And so please remember that, be faithful, be consistent uh, in your giving. Thank you so much. Listen, last week we started something, uh, or I did, when I told you that in times of crisis or difficulty or calamity or any other word you want to use to describe negative circumstances that arise, sometimes unexpectedly, um, there are two important truths about God, attributes, characteristics, but really two important truths about God that I hang my hat on to get me through whatever difficulty uh, comes my way. And I've been doing this since the day I got saved. The first I heard about these two attributes, these two characteristics of God, uh, I, I believed them and uh, I've been using them to uh, allow me to get through the difficult trying circumstances of life, right? And it keeps my fear level to a minimum. And, and, and that first one we looked at last week was on the fact that God is a sovereign God. Sovereignty or sovereign is defined as that God is able to do all his holy will and that which he has created. So we know that the God we serve, the God that created us, that created this world, that he is able to do all that his holy will uh, desires to have happen. And what God desires to happen, nothing can stop it. And so we looked at that in depth last week. Remember in Genesis 18, 14, when the question was posed to Sarah, when she heard that her and Abraham would be with child and she laughed at the Lord, the Lord asked her a very pertinent question for us. And that's simply this, is anything too difficult for the Lord? I mean, when calamity arises, really isn't that the question we wanna answer? Is anything too difficult? Like what I'm going through, which seems like a tsunami, seems like an avalanche, a volcano has erupted in my life. The thing that I want to ask myself continually is anything too difficult for the Lord. What's too great for me is not too great for him. And then, you know, the angel of the Lord answered that question in Luke 1 37 when speaking to Mary about the fact that she would be with child. When she said, how can this be? He said, listen, in Luke 1 37, he said, the angel of the Lord said, for nothing shall be impossible with God. Now, isn't that a wonderful truth to hang on to right now? There's nothing that's impossible. So he's God, he's sovereign. There's nothing that can take place that he can't control, start, or stop. And the fact that there's nothing he can't do. And then when you understand that, that way when I go through the calamities of life, the stresses, the, the, the difficulties, and I remember that my God is sovereign, and that so if something's happening in my life, even the stuff I don't want to have happen, if it's happening in my life, I know this, it's only because God is allowing it. Because if God wanted to stop it, he could. If God had wanted to keep it from ever getting in my life, he could have. But for whatever divine reason, he has chosen not to stop it. And I believe when you understand that and couple that with Romans 8, 28 and 29, for Paul wrote, this in Romans 8 28 he said and we know that God causes all things now in, in in my church when we say the word all I say the the word all in the Greek means it means all so we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God to those who are the called according to his purpose so God is going to take everything that happens in the life of a follower of Christ everything good bad everything he's going to take and he's gonna work it together for good. Now, now, where we get this misconstrued is that we think that means for our personal good. It means we're gonna get more money, a better job, a bigger car. Uh, no, that's not what God is saying there. That's not what he's saying at all. God is saying that he's gonna take all of the experiences of your life, child of God, and he's gonna work it together for good. And he qualifies who he's gonna do this with to those who love God to those who are the called according to his purpose. Now, Romans 8, 29 
teaches us the purpose. So, and that's where Paul writes, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. Now that conformed to the image doesn't mean we're all gonna get olive skin and look Middle Eastern. What Paul is saying there is that we, that God is gonna take all of the experiences of your life, good, bad, and everything in between, and he's gonna work it together for the good. And the good that God is referring to through the Apostle Paul is that you are gonna be conformed to the character of the Son of God so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. That you're gonna be, uh, that. so what's most important in this life is not our personal uh, wants and desires, it's that we would be so shaped on the inside by the character of Christ that through the Holy Spirit, it begins to manifest itself on the outside of us so that we might be the witnesses God has called us to. And we wrapped up last week with what I consider to be a, a phenomenal quote. I've, I've, I've thought of this all week. When Charles Spurgeon wrote, when you go through trials, the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which you lay your head. And I hope that stays with all of us for the rest of our lives. And so... This week, I want to give you the second truth that allows me to go through crises and difficult circumstances. We looked at sovereignty, and here's the other truth that I hang my hat on, and it's this. I remember God's love in crisis. I remember that he's sovereign, that he can do whatever he chooses to do according to his holy will, and I remember that he loves me. He's sovereign and he loves me. And those are the two truths about God that I hang my hat on that allows me to navigate the difficulties of life. And we're gonna look at the fact that God loves us through a very familiar text to most of us. It's found in the third chapter of John's gospel. You know this, it's verses 16 through 18, where John wrote, Jesus was having a dialogue with a man named Nicodemus, a religious ruler of the Jews, and Jesus is going to hit Nicodemus with what we call the gem of the gospel. So when you read this, understand, it wasn't just anybody saying this. It was the very word of God, the son of God, the son of man who is sharing with Nicodemus, this lost religious leader, this gem. And here it is, you ready? Most of you can say it with me, probably your kids can. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Now stop, that him there is not God, it's Jesus, the son of God, or God the son. For God did not send the son, Jesus, into the world to judge the world, but that the world, and the world there is not the globe, it's people, might be saved through him, and the him is Christ. And then the next verse, verse 18 says this, he who believes in him, now who's the him? We gotta identify who the him is, it's Christ. It's not God, it's Christ, his son. He who believes in Christ is not judged. And he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And that name is Jesus Christ. And that name is the name that Acts 4.12, Luke writes, there is no name under heaven given among men whereby man might be saved. It is the only name that saves. So if you're here listening to me today and you've always hung your hat on your salvation, on the thought that I believe in God, and I think that's what you got, you got to believe in God. No, John is saying that is not at all what's going to get you to heaven. You must believe in the name, the person, and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only name that God the Father will allow anybody into heaven is through his son, Jesus Christ. And so we're going to look at the love of God, and we're going to see three things this morning. The first thing we're going to see about the love of God is it's a personal love. It's a personal love. Now, if you were here a few weeks ago during our uh, series on love that I did. I, I preached four sermons. First, the love of God. The second one was the love for God. The third was the love for the, our brethren, the saints. And the fourth was loving the lost like Christ did. So you're going to be familiar with some of this. But listen, this morning, I want this to be applicable to the crisis. 
Like in other words, I want you to think about the love of God this morning and I want you to think of it as it relates to how you can move through this crisis in a way in which you can be a great witness for Christ. While others are running around losing their minds and they're living in fear, we don't have to. Because as children of God, we serve a God that is all powerful. He can do whatever he wants according to his holy will. And he's a God that loves us. And so the first thing we're gonna look at is it's a personal love. Look at the gem again, John three sixteen. The Bible says, uh, John writes, uh, Jesus speaking, for God so loves the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have, ever, have eternal life. Now, when this conversation was taking place, we know that Jesus told Nicodemus that God loved the world and that, that God, in fact, had sent his son into the world, not to judge it, but to save the world. I want you to understand something. He was saying it to an individual. And when I witness to people that are, uh, are uh, lost, uh, that are not saved, that are not born again, I always read them this verse and then I change, I, I insert their name because I want them to see that God's love is a personal love. So I'll read it for God so love the world, that for God so love Jim or for God so love Dandy or Jeff or Trudy or whoever that he gave his only begotten son because honestly, it's not enough to know in times of crisis that God loves the world. I gotta know he loves me. And you got to know he loves you. If we're going to get through the crises of our life, we not only need to know that God is sovereign who can do anything and everything according to his holy will, we also need to know that he loves us on a personal level. A.W. Tozer had this to say about the love of God. He said, the love of God is one of the great realities of the universe a pillar upon which the hope of the world rests. But it is a personal, intimate thing too. God does not only love populations, he loves individual people. He, may, he not only loves the masses of humanity, but also the individual. Friends, it is so important this morning that we understand something. If, if you're in the midst of a crisis, if God forbid you just found out you had COVID-19, and I came up to you and said, hey, Jeff, did you know in your moment of crisis, in your moment of great distress, I came to you and said, hey, man, Jeff, I just want you to know God loves the world. Is that going to have the same effect on you as me telling you in the midst of your crisis, Jeff, I want you to know that God loves you, that God loves you you we don't have the time this morning but if we did we'd turn to luke chapter 15 in fact let's turn to luke chapter 15 1 through 10 i just want to read i'll read it really quick i want to make a comment about how jesus notice in chapter 15 verse 1 the bible says now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to listen to him now you need to understand that that uh, the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble saying this man receives sinners and eats with them. So here we have a case where Jesus is eating with what the religious Jews would say was the scum of the earth. Sinners and publicans. Sinners and tax collectors, okay? And they're standing outside this uh, dinner engagement and they are thumbing their nose up at the people. They're thumbing their nose up at Jesus because man, if Jesus was all that he said he was, why on earth would he spend his time with people like this? Jesus, knowing the thoughts of men, begins to tell some stories to make a point to him. The first one he tells, Luke verses 15, 1 through 7, we read this. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, verse 2, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable saying, now who's the them? I believe it was both parties. I believe it was his dinner guests, and I believe he was saying it for the religious hypocrites that were listening as well. And he says this, what man among you, if he has a hundred sheep has, and has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. When he has found it, 
He lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors and he's saying to them, rejoice with me for I have found my sheep which was lost. And then Jesus says this, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. The Bible says, Jesus says in that verse 7, that there is going to be joy in heaven whenever someone who's lost is saved. And friend, if you were lost and you have been saved uh, by, by placing your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, right now I want you to know that heaven, when that happened, there was great joy in the halls of heaven. And I want you to understand as we deal with this issue that we're going through, God is sovereign. He can do anything in accordance with His holy will. And He loves you. He not only loves the world, He loves you. He knows you. He knows your name. The Bible teaches us that He knew our names before the foundation of the world. He knew me before the foundation of the world. And He knows all those that He calls to be His children in that way. And so, man, in my biggest times of crisis, let me tell you something. <laughs> it's important for me to know God loves me. I'm like, I'm glad he loves Jeff and AJ and Lee. I'm glad he loves that, the people at AFM. I'm glad he loves the world. But in times of crisis, I need to know he loves me. Let's go on real quick with the second story he tell. He told in verse, starting verse eight, he said, or what woman, if she has 10 silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. Verse nine, when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And listen to what that says. There is joy in the presence of angels. It doesn't say the angels have the joy. It's saying in the presence of angels, there is joy. And you know who's in the presence of angels? God the Father and God the Son. And they are rejoicing over the lost person that has come to faith in Jesus Christ. Friends, I want to tell you, in this crisis time, God loves you. Second truth is this. Not only is it a personal love, it's a proven love. I have a saying I use at Agape all the time. I use it in my life, and it's simply this. Listen to me. Love is only known by the action it promotes. Love is only known by the action it promotes. In other words, listen, uh, married couples, you know what I'm saying. If, if your spouse said, I love you a bunch of times, but never backed it up with anything that proved that love, that demonstrated that love, there'd come a point when you'd look at them and say, man, I don't even want to hear it. That doesn't mean anything to me. And what you're really saying is, you're not showing me your love. And yet, let's see if God backs his declaration of love in John 3, 16 up with a demonstration. Look at John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. That's the declaration. Look at the demonstration that he gave his only begotten son. You see, love is only known by the action it promotes. And so God's love is proved by the sending of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into this world so that he might die and be the propitiation, which means he absorbed the wrath of God so that you and I who repent of our sin and come in faith to Christ would never have to face that wrath John 15, 13, Jesus says this, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Greater love has no one. So when Jesus says, this is Jesus, and by the way, he's saying this on his way to the garden, on the way to his arrest, and, and soon his execution, he's telling his disciples, listen to me. I want you to know something. The greatest act of love is to lay your life down for the object of your love. Christ laid his life down for me and for you. Praise God for that truth. Listen, in moments of crisis, I need to know that my God is sovereign, but I also need to know he loves me. And when the tsunami waves of distress come at me, you know what I do that makes his love so proven? I just 
think of his love demonstrated on the cross. I just look at the cross. Spiritually speaking, I just look back to the cross and say, not only is my God able to do anything in accordance with his will, but he has demonstrated his love in the giving of his only son. The son has demonstrated his love in the fact that he was willing to lay his life down. It's a proven love. I can hang on to that love. It has happened, it's proven, and it's mine. And then finally, there's a third love. It's a permanent love. God's love is a personal love. It's a proven love. And it's a permanent love. Look at what John 3.16 tells us again. For God so loved the world, we see the declaration that he gave his only begotten son. We see the demonstration. And that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's the destiny connected with his love. You have a choice, friend. You might be watching this today. Maybe you're one of those religious people that have been hanging your hat on believing in God, or I got dunked when I was eight years old after VBS, or, or I gave money to the church, or my granddaddy built the church, or my mama played the piano. Or whole, now listen, man, friends, all of that will never get you to heaven. It's what you do about Jesus Christ that's gonna get you to heaven. Have you literally at the foot of his cross surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ that's what's going to get you to heaven God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish shall not it doesn't mean you're not going to die physically uh, Hebrews tells us it's the point under men wants to die and after this the judgment and until Jesus returns we're all going to eventually die okay whether it's the COVID heart attack old age we're all going to die christian and non we're all going to die but for the christian death is nothing but a departure paul said it this way in philippians 121 he said to live is christ and to die is gain listen friends if you're going to tap into the personal proven permanent love of god it starts at the cross of the lord jesus christ you understand it you don't get to just claim it if you're going to tap into the, per, the personal, proven, permanent love of God, it starts at the cross. Here's what Paul said about the gospel that saves in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. He says, verse 1, he says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel, which, that word means good news, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand. So he preached it, they received it, they took their stand on it. Verse 2, by which you are also saved... If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Now, let's stop right there before we go on to verse 3. Let's back up to verse 1. Here's what he said in verse 1. He says, listen, uh, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel, the good news, which I preached to you, which you received. When he preached it, they received it. And then they did something with what they received. They took their stand on it. And when they took their stand on it, here's what happens, Paul says, verse 2 by which also you are saved. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Here's the gospel. You ready? Verse three. For I deliver to you as the first importance, not second, not third, not fourth, first importance, what I also received. You know, in other words, a preacher can't preach anything that he himself hasn't received, right? He's preaching the gospel because he had received the gospel. For I deliver to you as the first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and so what paul says to us is that listen more important than anything else is the gospel and the gospel is this that jesus christ the son of god was born of a virgin lived a sinless life died a sacrificial death and on the third day he was raised out of the tomb by the power of the uh, of the father He's ascended back to heaven. He sits on the right hand, and one day he's coming back for his bride, those who place their faith in him. So it's all about the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to leave you with this thought this morning, Romans 10, 9 and 10, uh, before we wrap up, about before you're going to get the personal, proven, permanent love of God, before you can appropriate it in this time of crisis, Paul says this. He says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him Christ from the dead 
you will be saved. Let's read that again. Listen, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. In verse 10, Paul says, for with the heart, a person believes resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth, he confesses resulting in salvation. Listen, there are no such thing as secret service Christians. There's not one encounter in the Bible where someone met Jesus, had an encounter, and didn't walk away shouting about how Jesus had blessed their life. Listen, friend, we ought not be ashamed of the one who bled and died for us. Right now, in this midst of this COVID-19 craziness, we have the answer, and it's Jesus. And we need to be living lives that display the reality of what we're professing with our mouth that God is sovereign and he loves me. It's permanent love too. I want to end with this John 10, 27 through 30. Here it is, you ready? Jesus spoke, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand listen friends god is sovereign it is the pillow on which we can lay our head the sovereignty of god but the blanket that i'm wrapped in is his love it's a personal love it's a proven love and it is a permanent love and it's not based on my goodness his love for me is based on his perfect goodness his sinless character god is love friend this week i hope these last two weeks have helped you man let's walk in the peace that passes all understanding let's trust the sovereignty and love of god as we walk through this together i love you let's pray father in heaven thank you for this opportunity to gather once again Oh God, we ask you to put a divine hedge around our homes, our families, our workplaces, Lord. And we just pray your will be done. Help us to be the light that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.